through prayer when the Holy Spirit says yes. So, so Daniel said to me, he wanted to share uh, about a month ago. I prayed about it, and then he was ready. He phoned me. I said, yes, this is a good week. We want to hear from you. And I'm really pleased that Daniel is here. This is Daniel Davidson, and he'll introduce himself and tell you a bit about himself. But he's preaching today. Lord Jesus, we pray for Daniel. And I ask that your Holy Spirit fill him to the brim right now. Lord, we claim this ground as sacred ground. And we ask that your voice will be heard. I ask that if there's people that don't believe in you, that are having trouble, yep. people that are lost, maybe they don't even know they're lost, people that are missing something. God, I know what the answer is, and it's so easy for me to say, but it's hard when, when you can't see you. I'm asking that you open your eyes, Lord, open their eyes so that they can see you. I'm asking that you'll knock on the door so hard that they'll open it. And they'll say yes instead of no. And stop trying to figure everything out and rather just believe in you, Lord. And that you'll figure it out for them. God, I ask for a miracle today that people will be saved here today and through our video as well. Bless Daniel. Speak through him. In your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. It's so wonderful to be here today. I uh, I came when Trooper did his uh, his testimony, and I was uh, I was seriously moved by your guys' faith. Uh, just uh, just really touched by you guys. I I uh, I've spent some time in a very very uh, conservative church, and I just tell you, I just felt a great vibe and felt the Holy Spirit here. Heidi was talking to us about earlier about like the Spirit is here, and it's like I know that. I also want to just appreciate Carson. Carson for, uh, and I, I watched him preaching downtown and I just, I was so moved, right? You know I mean? Just such a real, raw love for the Lord. Uh, it was just dynamite. dynamite. I'm going to criticize you briefly. Are you? you I want you here so that you we, can, here? So we can record it. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but that sounds good. good. That's not really much of a criticism. That's okay. Ooh, it's like better sound over here. Ooh. Cool. So uh, I'm just going to warn you. I'm going to kind of throw a little bit of a thought of death up. Anybody afraid of death here? Anybody not afraid of death here? I kind of, I kind of feel like I'm on both sides, right? You know. Um, I'm going to share a scripture here later on about that. Um, so I just want to start out with uh, how I met Carson. So me and Carson. <sighs> My daughter was having some real trouble. She was at, I want to say YYC or something like that, a youth, a youth, uh, a youth group, uh, or a youth. I don't know. They kind of put her into a into a into a place, and uh, we went there as a group, and we went down to Carson, and Carson had this this group where he was bringing bringing children kind of coming to know themselves through music. And me and my daughter had had a falling out, probably a little bit of a staunchy Christian thing in me. And my daughter was just, you know, as I was, this crazy rebel, just headed on her own path. And Carson sat us down together and we, we actually kind of restored our relationship there at the piano, writing a song together that Carson kind of had to sit down to do. And it was just, it was just amazing to see God working in that. And Carson kind of bringing that together for me and my daughter. To have this, this unification and coming back together as family, right, you know? As a father with his daughter, it was just so amazing for me. Just going to blow this shotgun and blow it off for you. So about five years after that, right? About five years after that, I'm, I'm with my daughter and we're starting to plan about her going back to school and getting her shit together because she's just, her world's falling right apart. And uh, we go out to sing karaoke that night, you know, just spend a little time together. And, uh, you know, we watched the Oilers lose to the Flames, which was like, oh my goodness, right? Like, how could that happen? And because we were renovating the house, I left my daughter in the basement and I went home to my mom's house just to sleep at my mom's house because I couldn't stand the, the pain there. And I woke up to see, uh, my phone was ringing and I, I'd answered it and it was, my, it was my ex. And she had told me that 
my daughter had passed away that that evening. And I, and I don't want to get stuck on that thought because I'm going to tell you, God's even blessed me within that, right, you know? But I want to just take a look at this thought of, it made me think about what happens if I die, right? What happens if I die and I left my children and my ex or my wife behind me? God shows us behind the veil a couple times, right? In Scripture we see when Jesus is baptized, the heavens opened up and the Holy Spirit ascended on Jesus to, and that was a real sign that this is a special guy. This is not a normal guy. This is heaven opening up, right? You know, I think of Stephen, Stephen, so I don't know if you know the story of Stephen in Acts 7, but Stephen is sitting there and he's, he's kind of accusing all these, all these, the Sanhedrin and all these people that are getting really on him because he's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the Messiah, the God has come in the flesh, and they have rejected him. And we just get this little vision as, as they're picking up the stones to kill him. He looks up to heaven and, and God gives him this glorious vision that there's Jesus standing. And I think about that, that Jesus is standing there, right? You know what I mean? One of the next times we see him will be as a warrior, right? Riding on the white horse. And he is standing there, and he is saying, you know, he, he screams out, look, I see the Son of Man standing beside the Father. And I like that he stood up. And I think that he is standing up for all of us, too, when we have these injustices in our life. Paul talks about um, in Philippians 1, 20, 1 to 25, for me to live is Christ, and for me to die is gain. If I'm living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me, yet what should I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for me to be with you and remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. He wants to stay here, even though he knows it's better because he wants to, he wants to put more into the body of Christ. Paul wants to put more into, into our lives. Um, did you ever love something here on earth? Maybe a guitar. <laughs> Maybe your bike, right? You know what I mean? You, you put your lights on, you do your exhaust. I think about my guitar. I remember one time, oh my goodness. I used to let my kids play with anything, but I had this Ibanez gem guitar, and like I remember coming home one time, and, and the case was open, and they delayed with the tuning on it, and I came home and brought them all, and yelled, and screamed, it's like, don't mess with that. That's my special thing, right, you know? Um, do you have children in your lives? Do you have relationships that you really truly cherish? If you were ripped away from them, and I think, you know, for, for the people that drive a bike, I drive a big truck, right? You know what I mean? I got a big truck, it's a T800, and I've got like 120,000 pounds of sand on it, right, you know? And let's say, you know, you're, you're coming down the highway towards me, we're on a two-lane road, and a bee goes up into your mask or something like that, and I'm fiddling with something, and, and we meet like this, that's it, right? And you're gonna be with your maker. Is there something that you're gonna be missing? You're gonna be missing, you wanna, you wanna share with those loved ones. That's what I, I kinda really thought about is, what would I wanna share with my children, you know? What would I want to share with them? What would I want to share with my friends? Would you want to say like, don't believe the lies. The shoes won't make you happy, you know? The fancy car really doesn't mean shit, right, you know? What would you really want to pass on to them? It's not all about money. These lies can kind of work on us a little bit, right, you know? 
I think about when I was a child, and I would have been about this tall, you know what I mean? And I, I remember carrying around my 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 uh, comfort blanket, Blanco, with me, you know. And and uh, my dad was supposed to pick me up this one time from daycare, and all the other children left, and my dad didn't show up. So instantly, I start thinking about the lies here, right? You know, like, and I remember writing about it, and it's like, oh, my dad. Maybe he sold me for a chocolate bar. Or maybe he got maybe he got a new order for the boat. I don't know what it was, but that's that's kind of some of these lies that we want to protect people about, right? You know, uh, it wasn't that at all. My dad told me his ADHD and and he was out selling me and focused on what he was doing. And and I'm that same guy, right? You know, so I don't want to believe that lie. I went down uh, during COVID. I started a home church and and. Uh, we had gone to sit down uh, to have lunch on 82nd down. And as I'm walking by 82nd, I always, I always like to stop and talk to the street preachers, right? You know, because I just love Jesus, right? And I admire them for what they do. Anyway, so we're going down this, as we're going for supper, we uh, we have this, uh, the street preachers on the, on the road, and I probably said hi to them as I walk by. We go and have supper and I come back and and the gay crime group is all kind of taken over, right? You know what I mean? And they chase them out of the way. And I go, and I kind of like, I decide that, okay, we're gonna go there. I'm gonna go talk to them and let them know my mind, right? You know what I mean? And, and I go there and I, and I step up and I, and I kind of see, um, I look over it and I'm like, hey, I know you. Where do I know you from? And he's like, we coach football together. And I'm like, wow, wow. That's that's kind of crazy, right? You know what I mean? Wow, I, I, I wow, I never knew, right? You know what I mean? And then I, I said, like, who's the leader here? Just let me talk to the leader. And uh, guy comes over, you know, and he, and we start talking, and he says, I'm really just trying to keep these people from committing suicide. They have come mostly from Christian houses, and uh, and they get thrown out of the house. And I'm just really trying to save them from killing themselves. And I just tell you, I had to walk away with this completely different point of view. And and after listening to them more and more, it's like uh, I walked in with one point of view, and I walked out with another one. I had compassion for them because I kind of left there going, they need Jesus more than we do, right? You know what I mean? Like, wow, Jesus needs them too. In the creation story, I think about the creation story, and we always kind of see, we think about, you know, um, we think about Eve. Oh my goodness, I'm going to say it. Women can get upset with me here. But, oh, you know, Eve, Eve took the apple, right? You know, Adam was there too. And we, and we tend to focus on, on, on Adam or Eve or the serpent. But I want us to consider something different, right? You know, that, that God made this world, right? You know, so we see in the beginning creation, we see God making this world. He creates the oceans for us. He gives us a season. So like yesterday I'm out and, and me and my girlfriend, we see this red, this red thing. And it's just, it's so amazing what God has done for us. You know what I mean? Just even the fact that we have the seasons and we just have this eruption of color into the into the scenery right now is it's truly amazing, right? The plant life that breathes out oxygen so that the animals that are gonna breathe out carbon dioxide and breathe the oxygen in, and that's the plants that there and they, they take the carbon dioxide in and that helps grow them. He's made mankind in his own image. Every one of our eyes are unique. He's just a master in the masterpiece. All of our fingerprints are a unique identifier. There's our DNA, there's the sunrise, and there's the sunset. And I just think about this this morning that, like, God, God throws water up into the sky and whenever he does that, somehow it just lingers. It, it just sounds crazy that water's up in the sky, but it creates the most beautiful thing when the sun goes down. 
And I love a sunset where there is this water in the sky. It just sounds crazy, but that's one of the things God's decided to do for us and give us. Do you know that without the moon, the tides wouldn't happen and the world would die? This is crazy, right? you know? I love looking at, at the moon, but it has a complete purpose. It's part of God's engineered plan. And we are that prize of God's creation. We're the cherry on top of the Sunday for him. We're the last thing that he, he did. And after he made us, he rested. So I just, I think it's interesting to know that like, so, so God said that you should not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we did. And we did. And with that, God didn't want us sticking around there because he didn't want us stuck in that state. So he put us out of the garden. But if there were tears that God cried anywhere in the Bible, I think that this is one of the spots where he would have cried. Because he's been ripped away, right? He's been ripped away by his cherished possession. He loves us so much. He created, he created the world. He created the people. And like, that's his children. And yet with, with the sin that entered into the world, there was a separation now. And I think Adam and Eve, they, that, boom, they're all having kids, right? They're having a fun time. You know, they're all busy and stuff. But God is sitting there, you know, with the, with the Son, with the Spirit, but really missing His. His bike or his child or his whatever you you would miss if you were not here today. If 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 the chasm separated us now, you would miss them. And God misses us. He loves us so deeply that when when sin came into the world, and Habakkuk talks about it, but his eyes can't even fathom that. He, there has to be a separation. He did that so that we would not remain in that state forever by eating from the tree of life. But he wants relationship with us. I'm going to give you a little spoiler, but we get a chance to get back to the tree of life. We do. Um, you're special to God. I love, um, I've done some uh, studying of some therapy, and I love this guy, Terry Real. He talks about sin as being an archer's term, meaning that you're missing the mark. And I like that thought, right? You know what I mean? I think sin sometimes has a bad thing, but God wants to, you know, he, he's given us his book that he wants us to have that abundant life, right? The thief, right, which would be Satan, comes to kill, steal, to destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and life more abundantly. Ephesians 1 4 says that he has chosen us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love. He's chosen us before he even had creation. So I just want us to think about that for a second. That like before, like this this predates everything in the Bible except for maybe maybe John 1 1 that says like um, what's John 1 1? Anybody help me with that one? In the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And somewhere around that time, he was thinking about you. We're always on his mind. The psalmist says, From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, he considers everything they do. <laughs> Jesus also gives us uh, when he was asked what the most important commandment is he said that uh, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind and soul and I just think like why like, why do we want to do that well the reason we do is that he loves us he loves us first right before the creation of the world he loved us 
And I love this second command, and I'm just going to turn the words around a little bit because I think that we forget this sometimes, but the second command he says is like it. And I'm going to say that we need to love ourselves, right? And I think that God is so so amazing that he loves us, and we've got to trust what he says about us, right? That we are lovable. And then we need to put that same measure to others. <laughs> um, and we have to watch out for the lies. We were doing the chain breaker, or uh, did the chain breaker there today and said that we were living the same old lies. And I just want to give you one of these lies that can, that can trick us a little bit, right? You know, and I gotta tell you, even as I was writing this sermon, right, you know what I mean? It's there, right, you know? But I just want to give you, here's God's truth. I'm going to give you one of God's truths here. And this is, this is we, we talked about this just a little bit ago, about heaven opening up. But when, right after heaven was opened up, and something like a dove came down on Jesus, a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, and I am well pleased. And it's just a couple verses later on that we find devil going, or, you know, Jesus going out to the, to the desert to be tempted. And this is what Satan says. He says, if you are, right, you know? So I just want you to think about that doubt. If you are the Son of God and you're hungry, you can turn these stones into bread. Could God have done that in Jesus? Absolutely, right, you know what I mean? And then he says again, if you are the Son of God, you know, jump up, jump up this temple. You know, and, and God has commanded these angels that they will not let your feet touch the ground. That's the truth. But Satan just tries to work that lie in a little bit, right? You know, as I'm preparing, I'm, I'm like Monday, tell Carson, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. Man, nope, I got to do it this Sunday. <laughs> Man, this morning, yesterday, it's like, whoa. <laughs> I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if you can do this. Are you surely a son of God? Uh, I'd like us to get embraced in God's truth and get away from the lies of the devil. I love how Jude Jude talks about this a little bit. It's it's um, it's just an interesting thing. And again, you know, so. To die and then the judgment, you know? To be dead here is to be with Christ, right, you know? Um, and I love how Jude opens up this little tiny picture here for us, right, you know? But it's it's who we're dealing with, right, you know what I mean? It's who we're dealing with on the other side. We have a, a mighty father. We have a warrior in Jesus that is warring for our soul. But we do have an adversary, too. So in Jude, it, it opens up a little bit that the archangel Michael is disputing with the devil over the body of Moses. What, what right does he have for the body of Moses? Would anybody know? Anybody have an idea why, why Satan may want Moses' body? Or what? Because he's a murderer, right? He was a murderer. He probably had the same claim on David, right? You know what I mean? And I love what, what the archangel says. He says, the Lord rebuke you. Right, you know? The archangel Michael does not need to dispute with him, but he just says, the Lord rebuke you. Right? And Moses is with God in heaven. Um, I like to think about myself. You know, and I, and I try to paint a little bit of a picture for death for us, right? You know what I mean? So... Here I am. I'm at the judgment seat of Christ. And what is my what is my defense? If if Satan is there, in all his darkness and whatever power he's been given by God, because he's a creation, he's not even close to God, right? You know? But if he's the if he's the crown attorney and he wants to accuse me and he wants to bring up everything I've done wrong, and the list is like it's over here, right? It's just lined up. It's just lined up. I love to sit on the promises of God, right? You know? And God says that 
we can have he'll have mercy upon whom he'll have mercy and i love that right you know what i mean there's there's uh there's a thief on the cross but i really like i really like the the other gentleman and it's a paraplegic is is lowered in a mat before jesus and jesus says your sins are forgiven and what he tells him he says after after your sins are forgiven and he does want to acknowledge that Jesus wants to acknowledge to everybody there in the crowd that he is able to forgive sin. But he does tell him to get up and walk. And I just, you know, we can rely on the mercy of God there, but to make things more sure for us, we can stand on the promises of God. And I have a couple verses here. Maybe, does anybody have their Bible here that can maybe give me a couple of verses here? Yeah, I see that's the person. So, John 3.16. Does anybody know that one? I'll take somebody saying it out loud. Yeah? Awesome. Awesome. I love that. I love that one. John 3.16. If you can't hear that, you can always look it up. I have another one here, too. Throw another one at you. So, so again, that we believe, right? You know, and, and really, what do we want to believe that we can stand on that promise? I would say that, that God came in the flesh. His name is Jesus, right? You know what I mean? Uh, that he died on the cross for our sins. Oh my god, I don't know that one. I think that's what you were quoting. Yeah, probably. Um, and that he was raised from the dead. You know? That he was raised from the dead. This is a this is a special thing. I don't know anybody who's been raised from the dead. No, all kinds of guys have done crazy things, but you know, that sets Jesus apart. And and really his bones aren't here today, because he's not here. He went up to heaven in a cloud. There's no doubt on my mind on that. Uh, so another another point of the promises of God, Mark 16, 16. Anybody know that one? Mark 16, 16. I just love this one too. And I love to kind of tie this together. I remember I remember working on engines and and Detroit's a terrible engine to work on. You gotta look at one part of this thing over here. To, to do the engine, you gotta look at another part over here to do the connecting rods, and then you gotta look back over here for the valve cover. You got it? Yeah. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Awesome. Awesome. I like to cherish that first part, right? Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And that's when, that's when I, I love this. It's from the mouth of Jesus. Right, you know what I mean? Um, Romans 10 9. Anybody got Romans 10 9? If you declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be, be saved. saved. I love it. I love it. I'll do this one. Acts 2 38. You know? So so Peter's Peter's talking to everybody, and, and basically he's He's kind of giving a, a history of Israel and how God chose them. And then he then he says, oh yeah, and then all you guys, all you guys killed them. The maker of everything, you guys all killed them, nailed them to the cross, and, and that's our Savior. And they kind of cried out in Acts 2.37, they said, what shall we do? They've been cut to the heart, and they say, what shall we do? And Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remissions of your sins. And it comes with a promise. And I love this promise. It's that you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Me and my girlfriend Cheryl here, <laughs> we were talking the other day about a doctor that maybe is not a great doctor, you know? And I think about this with a mechanic, you know? So, yeah, I got a red seal. Do you want me to do your transmission? No, I'm not a transmission guy, right? You know, you can have a doctor, he gets his ticket, 
I guess I would get my ticket as a mechanic. He would get his diploma as a, as a doctor, and then now he's a doctor. He goes on to do that. I got my ticket, you know what I mean? I loved where my, uh, my dean had said, okay, great, congratulations, you're a first year journeyman, right, you know what I mean? There's still so much to learn. The great thing about coming to Christ is that we have the Holy Spirit here working with us. And if you'll listen to the Spirit, you will have God. And if you listen to His Word and stay in the Word and pray back and forth with Him, God is there with you all the way. Turn my page here. So Christ promises to always be in a relationship with us when we should take Him on in baptism, in faith. Um, God is the way. And God bridges the chasm by giving us His Word. He sent His Holy Spirit over that chasm of, of death, a spiritual death that moved us away from Him. Uh, and we have the relationship with Him and He sent us His Word. That is, that is Him being on the other side of the chasm and out of His love he is, He's sharing with us, giving us. Thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. In John 2, we see the wedding in, in Gala. Gala? Gala? Is that right? Is that Gala? Yeah, yeah there we go. Um, and it's funny because I, I've heard lots of people kind of talk about how you know that justifies drinking wine and stuff, and I think, no. You know what? Once God has worked with us and our hearts and our souls, He wants to work with the family. And I think that's what Jesus was really doing at the wedding. God wants to work with families. He loves to see restoration. He wants our restoration with Him, and He wants to see the restoration of other families together. In there, I just want to take this one verse from there, and I, I hope I'm not taking this out of context, but when, when Mary asked him to, you know, handle the wine, he's like, it's not my time, it's not my time. And she turns to the servants, and she says, his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And I think there's something in there for us. For us to do whatever he tells us. This is a little bit of a warning here. And I like this, right? So I live my life, I told Jim that I was going to have this in. So I live my life in my youth, you know, from, from 16, maybe 14, 14 to, oh, I don't even know what the age was. It seemed to get weeded out of me more and more. But my heroes were Jim, Jimmy, Jimmy, and James, right? You know what I mean? So Jim Morrison, Jimmy Hendrix, Jimmy Page, and James Bond. <laughs> yeah? So, there's a little bit of a difference there. But you can imagine the lifestyle I embrace. Right? You know what I mean? And, you know, Paul talks about this in Acts. Or I guess it would be Luke writing about it. But, like, something like scales fall from his eyes. Right? You know? Um, once we kind of come to see the Lord, right? You know? There's a whole different way. Some of the some of the lies we've been told are taken away. We have this amazing truth that comes through us. In in Paul, right at the time of Saul, he's running around trying to chase out the church, trying to stomp on this Jesus thing that's happening, and he gets blinded. He gets up, and an eyes comes to baptize him, and all of a sudden, get something like scales falls from his eyes, right? And this is a great, a great time to be where we start to see the Lord closer and closer. And, and I think in, in Acts 17, he talks about, uh, Ananias, I think, says to him, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized, washing away your sin. Short-term pain, sometimes we go, want to go for short-term pleasure and we get long-term pain out of it. 
sin is funny for a season, and then it's not fun anymore. Once we get kind of caught into our snares. Jesus talked about the great gardener working in the vineyard and the vine pruning, pruning to produce good fruit. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While that branch does not bear fruit, he prunes, so it will be more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I also in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. This is to the Father's glory that you might bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in His love. I have told you this so that your joy may be complete in you, and your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one but to lay down their life for one of their friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I've learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, I love Jesus saying this, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, that you love each other. Okay, and finally getting some pretty behaviors. <laughs> Which is really where this whole thing started here. You, my brothers and sisters, this is Galatians 5.13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh, which is a liar a little bit. Uh, rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. I just want to talk just for one second as I, as I cut this verse in half here about sort of the lies of freedom and slavery, right? You know what I mean? And so many people these days will talk about a slavery and, and that we're kind of being controlled or we could be controlled because we don't drink or we don't do this and it's, oh my goodness, that's so terrible that we would, we would be held back like that. Like we are like slaves in that situation, but really? You know what? The real slavery is like addiction. Addiction becomes a slavery, right? And what we want to focus on, we want to kind of flip that lie of the world over, and we want to understand that we have freedom in Christ, that we are not bondage in a slavery anymore, but we have freedom in Christ. The slavery that, uh, you know, we're not tied into addictions. These are never fulfilled things, right? You know, if you smoke or you drink or you're addicted to cocaine or methamphetamines I don't think there's a there's not a there's not a, enough of that you want to keep pursuing that and that's that's part of the lie that's not a freedom that's a slavery right we have freedom in Christ the acts of the flesh are obvious and part of this I'm going to tell you part of this study has been for myself right you know what I mean as I've struggled with some of these things right here sexual immorality you know, and it's funny. This is this is something that the Lord has put on my heart here recently, and and I've just grown so much, and it's such a blessing, kind of coming out of that slavery, right? You know what I mean? Impurity, and this is kind of where I'm working on now: debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord. And I'm working on my discord because I I have little troubles with my discord. 
I've got this little back voice. And I, and, I, and, I, and I look at it, and I look back down into a roof, and I can see my mother sitting there, and, and it's almost like a possessed person a little bit, where she's just fighting for no reason, and it's causing this for her. And, and, and so I look at that, and I look to see how the Lord can work with me on that. And he's working on it. He, I love God because he creates the victories in these things, right? Jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. I think I have this memorized, but I'm going to flip this page anyhow. Uh, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And I think it's interesting here that Paul has written this to the church in Galatia. So I think that there is, you know, I, I'm believing that he's writing to people that have believed, repented, been baptized, pronounced them publicly, right? And these are lifestyles that we that really do not shine what the king wants for us. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking anyone or envying each other. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We do not belong to the darkness of the night. So be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and clear-headed. Night is a time for people to sleep and drinkers to get drunk. But let us live in the light, be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. I just got a couple more verses I want to just share with you a little bit on this thought. And, and, and Deuteronomy 28 is, is uh, it's funny because it's just a new verse, a new chapter for me, right? You know, and it talks about the blessings and the curses, but I just want to throw this blessing at you. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands I give you today, and really Jesus just summed that up, that we're to walk in love. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations. All these blessings will come to you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, and the crops of your land, and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket, your kneading trough, will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in, and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but they'll flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he has given you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as a promise, as he promised you on oath, if you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him. Then all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they will fear you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, and the crops of your ground, in the land he swore to the ancestors of Oak. The Lord will open up the heavens, the storehouses of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season, and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. The Lord will make your head, you will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top and never on the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of these commands I give you today to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. And I have one more verse that I thought I'd close with you today. And I just wanted to explain a little bit. When I was younger, when I was younger, I used to... Uh, I'd always befriend the tough guys, right? You know, the tough guys or the bad guys. Because if I ever met them at, you know, at night in a back alley, I really wanted to shake out a hand of friendship as opposed to, 
you know, fear, right? So I always kind of knew some of the bad guys, and I don't know, that was always the best thing for me, but I just want to paint a picture for you here. And the, and the psalmist just lines this up so great. Um, in my distress, and I'll tell you what, in, in all my battles, in my grief of my daughter's suicide, in the breaking up of my marriage, in, in, uh, in a lot of my challenges in my life, I, I love this verse here. In my distress, I called on the Lord. This is Psalms uh, 18, 6 to 19. Boy, I think I might have lost a page here. <laughs> In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. For his temple, he, from his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. The earth trembled and quaked, and the foundations of the mountain shook. They trembled because he was angry. Smoke rose from his nostrils, consuming fire came from his mouth, burning coals blazed out of it. He parted the heavens and the earth and came down. Dark clouds, dark clouds were under his feet. He mounted the cherubim and flew. He soared on the wings of the wind. He made darkness his covering, his canopy around him. The dark clouds, the dark rain clouds, the dark rain clouds of the sky. Out of the brightness, out of his presence, clouds advanced, and hailstones and bolts of lightning. The Lord thundered from heaven with a voice of the most high resounding. He shot his arrows and scattered the enemy. The great bolts of lightnings, he routed them. Oh my goodness, I think I forgot the last verse. Does anybody have that one? What verse is it? What's the... Psalm 18, 619. So I guess we're at, he shot his arrows and scattered the enemy with great bolts of lightning. Then in your command, O Lord, at the last breath, breath last of your breath, the bottom of the sea could be seen, and the foundations of the earth were laid bare. He reached down from heaven and he rescued me. Drew me out of the deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemies, from those who hated me and were too strong for me. Awesome. Amen. Awesome. Amen. He's a God who rescues from from the deep sea, from the deep water. He's there for me and you. And if you want to stand on those promises, again, I'll just say, you know, He calls us into a belief of Him. He asks us to believe in Him. He's, you know, for some reason he wants us to be baptized. He wants us to be, to be into, baptized into his death and rise up into a new life, into his resurrection. Uh, he wants to be Lord of our life. Not that he wants to overthrow this or overthrow our lives, but he just wants the best for us because he loves us. Thank you very much. Carson, you're going to come and say a word? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.